Well, or good morning. So uh, let's begin in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this chance, this opportunity to gather together and dig into your word. I pray that it changes us, uh, that it makes us more like your son Jesus, that it opens our eyes to the world around us. Help us to see the experiences and the mistakes and the, the successes of the people of scripture and uh, apply those things to our lives and so that we can learn from their mistakes, learn from their success, draw closer to you. And so we ask your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. We are in Ezekiel chapter 20. We're finishing up chapter 20. Uh, we left off last week in verses uh, 33 to verses 38. And so what we'll do is pick up there, do just a tad bit of review, and then we'll jump into the remainder of Ezekiel chapter 20. And um, and then we'll get through chapter 21 as well. So chapter uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 says, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with the wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. And I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. So again, we pointed out last week that this phrase here, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, there's a kind of a reference there of, of Jesus and the fact that he is the part of the Trinity that interacts with mankind uh, in a more tangible, physical level. Um, and so there's, again, uh, we're, we're beginning to see some prophetic ideas interspersed here in Ezekiel of what will eventually happen. While this is applicable to what's going on in Ezekiel's day to the people of Judah, there is application to this as well uh, in what Jesus will be doing. Because he states here that wrath will be poured out. Now, notice here it doesn't say where or on whom or how or anything like that. Uh, because we know that through Jesus, that wrath gets poured out upon him at the cross. He says, I shall be king over you. And of course, uh, this is one of the things with the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, that... Um, legitimates if that's a word it makes jesus the legitimate king uh not that he needs to have any uh, uh legitimacy uh expressed by us he is the creator so he is obviously king i will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with the mighty hand and with an outstretched arm there's that phrase again and wrath will be poured out again there's that phrase uh, the fact that they're scattered is significant. We're seeing that with the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And we're also seeing that now that, that um, with, with all people everywhere, we are uh, scattered from God. We are far from God. And part of this whole process is him redeeming us, bringing us back home. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. Here's an interesting phrase that we talked about last week. This is... Um, this is a place where where people, so the wilderness of the peoples, this is where people don't choose to live. This is where uh, people do not choose to go out and live in the wilderness. They choose places uh, uh, that are comfortable. They choose places that have uh, vegetation. They choose places that have water. And the wilderness is not like that. And I think there's, there's a reference here stating that when I call you back, you will be a people who look different, who live different. And so that is a, a reoccurring theme, a recurring theme uh, in scripture that um, we should look different than the world around us. We should live differently than the world around us. We should prioritize things differently. It says, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. Again, uh, consider the idea that uh, Jesus comes, lives among us face to face and that judgment that happens on the cross is something that is done face to face. Uh, he comes uh, and takes, uh, comes as a, as, a, as a human, as an infant, grows up as a, as a human being, fully God, fully man. And so he is face to face with us as he receives this judgment. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod. There's a, a reference to shepherd imagery. Um, passing under the rod, counting the sheep, separating the sheep, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Uh, again, uh, um, there is a new covenant that is expressed 
through Jesus on the cross, although that's also expressed in the book of Jeremiah. And so it's not necessarily new in the sense that the old is gone and done away with. This is a renewing of the covenant because now this wrath has been poured out. And so this covenant is renewed in the sense that it was broken and then the price was paid and the covenant is renewed. I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me, and I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn. But you will not enter the land of Israel, thus you will know that I am the Lord. Again, so much of what God does is to say, listen, I want you to know who I am. I want to know you. In fact, uh, Jesus says in John 17, this is eternal life, that we know God the Father and that we know Jesus and so it is certainly his entire desire that we would know him, yada, we would know him, and so that we can spend eternity with him. Uh, that is the whole point and the whole purpose of heaven. Heaven is not a place that you earn. It's not what you, uh, it, it is rightfully yours. Heaven is a place that uh, it's God's house because you know him, you are welcome in. And so this becomes um, the whole purpose of what God is doing. He wants us to know him. Okay, so that's where we left off last week. Let's go ahead and jump forward. As uh, Ezekiel 20, 39, it says, as for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve everyone his idols, but later you will surely listen to me and my holy name. You will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. We see at the beginning of chapter 20, the elders are coming before Ezekiel asking a question. We don't really know what the question is, but because of uh, this kind, this verse here, so God says, like, okay, go ahead, go serve your idols. It's potential that the elders were coming to say, listen, uh, all the people in Babylon, they serve their gods with idols. And so we would like permission to make an idol of Yahweh and so that we can serve Yahweh like the world around us does. And this is entirely against God's desire. He's certainly stated this explicitly in the Ten Commandments, multiple places throughout Torah. Uh, we are not to make an idol of an image of God. And the whole purpose of that is because we are the image. We don't want to relinquish that responsibility. We are meant to be the image that goes out into the world and shows the world what God looks like. We're not supposed to make one out of uh, wood or stone and set it somewhere. And so that uh, people have confused what God is or who God is um, by looking at that image. We are the image of God. He says, though, but surely listen, you will listen to me and my holy name. You will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. For on my holy mountain, that's Jerusalem, on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord God there, the whole house of Israel, all of them will serve me in the land. There I will accept them, and there I will seek your contributions and the choicest of your gifts with all of your holy things. As a soothing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. Again, just envision Jesus proving himself holy by giving himself as the sacrifice. Um, on a public road into uh, the city of Jerusalem. I will prove myself holy among you in the nations, and you will know that I am the Lord. There again is that phrase, you will know that I am the Lord, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your fathers, forefathers. There you will remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves, and you will loathe yourselves. If you could think for just a moment back to the, the time when you accepted Jesus, if, if there's a definitive moment in that process where you realized uh, that uh, the things in, that you had done, the, the priorities you've done in life, uh, not that you were some uh, serial killer, mass murderer, but the things that we've done in our lives and, and focused on uh, were, were not good. And so that process oftentimes causes us to loathe ourselves, but it's a two-sided coin because as in, in the moment that we begin to loathe ourselves and realize our need, then Jesus is there to provide for us and accept us and, and welcome us in. And so it's not that we are um, these horrible, terrible people, but it's that we say, oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm seeing now what God wants for me in my life. So again, we loathe ourselves in your own sight for all the evil things that you have done. Then you will know 
there's that phrase again, that I am the Lord and I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways or according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel. Now, again, this is going on at this time. Uh, God is sending his people into captivity in order to kind of wake them up and draw them back to him and with a pure heart. And so this is applicable to that moment, that end time, but also we're we're seeing a foreshadowing of what Jesus is doing. And God will deal uh, not with our evil ways. He doesn't act because of us. He acts for him in the sense that Jesus comes and he pays the price uh, for, for our deeds. But he does it for his name's sake. And, and it's not that we uh, sit back and, and worship him because he is so holy and so great, which he is, but it's because he's created us and he wants to live in relationship with us. And so living in relationship with us together, walking through life together, that's how he's created us. That is the best thing for us, the best way for us to live. Go on in the next verse, it says, verse 45. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face toward Teman. Okay, we've kind of now taken a turn. We're stepping into a different uh, prophecy. And speak out against the south and prophesy against the forest land of the Negev and say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm about to kindle fire, fire in you and it will consume every green tree in you and as well as every dry tree. The blazing flame will not be quenched and the whole surface from south to north will be burned by it. All flesh will see that I, the, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Then I said, O oh Lord God, they are saying of me, is he not just speaking in parables? And so, again, we're seeing the introduction of a new vision, which actually goes better with chapter 21, which is why in if you look in, in uh, Jewish versions of the Tanakh, the Tanakh is the title for uh, the Jewish Bible. Um, they will actually have these last few verses of chapter 20 put in chapter 21, the first few verses in chapter 21. So just be aware if you are ever happen happening to, to uh, look into the Jewish Bible, they say the same things, but the, the numbering of the verses sometimes are a bit different. So um, this ends chapter 20. I'm going to go ahead and we'll step into 21. And I want to point out here, that he's starting this new imagery, okay? God is introducing this new imagery of a forest fire, which is really confusing to the people of Israel. If you've ever been to Israel, Israel is 70% wilderness. And when, when the Bible talks about wilderness, it's not trees like what you see in the background here, a wilderness. It's not like, um, you know, the Midwest in America kind of wilderness. It's not Rocky Mountains kind of wilderness. This is like desert wilderness and it's not even like sandy desert it's like rock and gravel desert and uh and so for god to say hey there's going to be a forest fire the people then say mm, you must be speaking in parables here because that doesn't really make a lot of sense when we look at these places temen and negev and the south um doesn't make a lot of sense because there's not forests there and so uh, they're saying, oh, well, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what you're saying, but you're using imagery, which God is, but it's also a bit frustrating to God uh, because they're not taking him for what he's saying. So he will elaborate. Now, just a, a quick note, these uh, phrases here, Temen, the Negev, uh, the South, um, while they're South, and for you and I, that kind of means uh, down as we envision a map ancient Israel, they envisioned a map turned on its side. So south to them was to the right. Not real significant, just simply that it will come into play here in a few verses. Just we'll see. Again, so their vision of the world, it was kind of turned on its side. And so south would be to the right. So let's go forward. Uh, we then jump into Ezekiel chapter 21. And it begins with the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Jerusalem and preach against the sanctuary. Okay, prophesy against the land of Israel and say to her, this is what the Lord says, I'm against you. I will draw my sword from its sheath and cut off from you both the righteous 
and the wicked. Because I am going to cut off the righteous and the wicked, my sword will be unsheathed against everyone from south to north. Then all people will know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword from its sheath, and it will not return again. Uh, so when the people say, oh, you must be speaking in parables, then God restates what he said before using different imagery. And so he incorporates now a sword instead of a fire, and he states the exact same thing. So let me show you that side by side. So this is the end of chapter 20 in our Bibles, and this is the beginning of chapter 21. And you see the parallels. The word of the Lord came to me saying, the word of the Lord came to me. And then he says these three things, Timon, South, and Negev. Okay, when they say, we don't understand, God says, okay, I'm talking about Jerusalem, the sanctuary in Israel. And then these uh, things here says that the, the forest fire will consume the green tree and the dry tree. Over here, God says, if you don't understand, I'm saying that a sword is going to come against the righteous and the wicked. The, the same as the green tree and the dry tree. And then uh, it says all flesh are subject to this. And then God says, because I'm going to cut off the righteous and the wicked. So in other words, everyone, no one can claim that they're excused from this or they stand outside of this. It doesn't apply to them. This is according to everyone. My sword will be unsheathed against everyone from south to north. And then he closes up with, ah, Lord, you are saying these things uh, are parables. And so God explains these things and says, I'm doing this. And so you know, you know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword from its sheath. So again, a restatement of this using a little bit different imagery and being a little bit more a literal not so poetic. And so he's using Jerusalem sanctuary in Israel instead of the Timon south and the Gev. All right, then we go to the next one here. Verse six in Ezekiel 21 uh, says, therefore groan, son of man. Now remember that God is telling Ezekiel, I want you to, uh, you're doing this prophetic theater for me. So remember he's had him do all kinds of weird stuff, cut his hair, lay on his side, uh, build little uh, models. And now he's saying, go out in front of the people and, and groan. Uh, and then when you groan, they're going to ask, well, okay, what's, what's this mean? The, the, the prophet is doing something. He's acting something out, which is what happens. Therefore, groan, son of man, groan before them with a broken heart and bitter grief. And when they ask you, so that's the point, get them to ask, why are you groaning? You shall say, I would love to go on a, a sidetrack here. And, and we should be living lives that cause people to ask questions. Um, you think that's a, the, the best way of, of evangelism is not to shove ideas and facts down someone's throat, but to, in, uh, to, to, to make our lives so interesting and our love for others so interesting that they ask. So anyway, they're asking here, why are you groaning? You shall say, because of the news that's coming, every heart will melt with fear and every hand go limp. Okay, there's something coming that is not good. And even to the point, every spirit will become faint and every leg will be wet with urine. You're going to wet yourself. Is it coming? It is coming. It shall, it will surely take place, declares the Lord, or declares the sovereign Lord. There's a statement here talking about just drop show in my coffee there's a uh, it's a statement saying that when god's judgment comes it's not going to be pretty all right and this is a recurring message of scripture that when god judgment come, judgment comes it won't be pretty and god warns us of this and so uh if if you pray for the return of jesus and i do i pray for the return of jesus be aware that the transition from this world to to that world from this world that is run by uh we have the the, the prince of darkness uh, that satan is the prince of this world to where god if Jesus rules as king, that transition process is not going to be pretty, okay? In fact, uh, Amos talks about it. So Several of the prophets talk about it. Amos says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. And that's what we call this. 
we, we refer to that day of judgment as the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? The day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without any ray of brightness? And so let's be aware that that transition process is not going to be a pretty process. It doesn't mean that God is evil. It just simply means that the presence of evil will not go quietly into the night, let's say. Um, so be, be aware of that. Uh, it's also a statement there that kind of says that as the prophets are telling God's people, hey, this is going to be bad. So be aware of that. I, I think the same message is for you and I, that whenever the end times come, and I personally don't think that we're in the end times, so to speak, but um, whenever they come, it's not going to be uh, pretty, and we will have to endure things. But that's a different topic for a different day. So verse 8 says, the word of the Lord came uh, to me, son of man, prophesy and say, this is what the Lord says. A sword, a sword sharpened and polished, sharpened for the slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Shall we rejoice in the scepter of my royal son? Okay, um, so this gets a little bit confusing as to how to divide this up and who's saying what, but we'll go ahead. Shall we rejoice in the scepter of my royal son? And the sword despises every such stick. The sword is appointed to be polished, to be grasped with the hand. It is sharpened and polished, made ready for the hand of the slayer. Cry out and wail, son of man, for it is against my people. It is against all the princes of Israel. They are thrown to the sword along with my people. Therefore, beat your breasts. So here we have this. Uh, it's kind of like a song. Uh, a sword, a sword, sharpened and polished, sharpened for the slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. And then you have... Um, you have the people who then say, shall we rejoice in the scepter of my royal son? So the people in Jerusalem, they are thinking, ah, oh, this sword is going to come and protect us against Babylon. So shall we rejoice in the fact that uh, we have a scepter, the royal son, the lineage of uh, the people who are sitting on the throne, currently Zedekiah. Zedekiah is sitting on the throne of Jerusalem and he has the scepter, he is king. Shall we rejoice in this? And then the response to that is, no, the sword, so the judgment of God, despises every such stick. So these reducing this idea of a scepter to the guy who's sitting on the throne is not really a king. Zedekiah is not the king. He's not the righteous king. He's basically, he doesn't have a, a scepter. He's just carrying around a stick. And then there's ex the explanation. The sword is appointed to be polished, to be grasped with the hand, is sharpened and polished and made ready for the hand of the slayer. So God is the one who is putting out the, the judgment, the sword, and he's placing it into the hand of the slayer, which in this case is Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. And then he's, God is saying, cry out and wail, son of man. It's against my people. So God is saying, listen, I'm, I have to discipline my people, and I'm not happy about that. It's against the princes of Israel. So cry and wail that it is my people whom I have called, whom I've redeemed, whom I've uh, gone into a marriage vow with, that they are not listening, and therefore there is a sword. They are thrown to the sword along with my people. Therefore, beat your breast. It's a sign of mourning, beating your breast. So, um, again, Ezekiel is told to play this out. Tell the people that there is a sword, but it's not a sword that is in your favor. That is a sword that is against you. You see in verse 13, testing will surely come. And what if even the scepter, which the Lord despises, does not continue? declares the sovereign Lord. So God does, does have a scepter. He is holding the power of rulership in his hand because we know that the scriptures tell us that, uh, that, that God uh, puts kingdoms in place and he removes kingdoms. And so this scepter is in God's hand. 
And so then said a man prophesy, strike your hands together, you know, strike your hands together. Let the sword strike twice, even three times. And so the sword is slashing, uh, bringing about judgment. It is a sword for slaughter, a sword for great slaughter, closing in on them from every side so that hearts may melt with fear. That's that uh, initial statement that he had said there in that verse or that chapter. And many and the fallen will be many. I have stationed the sword for slaughter at their gates. Look, it is forged to strike like lightning. It is grasped for slaughter, slashed to the right. Your sword, you soar then to the left, wherever your blade is turned. I too will strike my hands together <clears throat> and my wrath will subside. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, uh, in the ancient world, the gates were the place where justice was delivered. It's also intended to be a place of safety. So the people where they think that they are safe, uh, God's saying, I will deliver justice, okay? So this is what this is all about. Uh, justice slash discipline that God is bringing to his people so that they might be redeemed, be brought back to him, be brought back in right relationship. Verse 18 continues, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, mark out two roads. For the sword of the king of Babylon to take. Both starting from the same country. This word Rhodes is the word derach. Um, beautiful word in, in Hebrew. It's so important. It's such a rich meaning. Um, in fact, we see that uh, God often talks about his way or his path, his road, his derach. Uh, and he says, I have a way or a road that I want you to travel. And he gives that to us. He explains it to us through the Torah and through his commandments of how he wants us to uh, live our life by treating others fairly, by loving on, on people, by releasing those who are oppressed, by treating people fairly, by measuring with the correct weights and measures, all of these things uh, that is that that are ways of showing love and equality uh, to people, uh, to allow diversity, to welcome in the foreigner, the stranger, to show hospitality, all these things. So it's a very rich word. I encourage you, if you ever do a, a word study, do a word study on that. It is, again, the word derach. But here he's saying, son of man, mark out two roads, two paths for the sword. That's, again, the judgment of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar to take, both starting from the same country. Make a signpost, it's literally make a hand that's pointing where the road branches off to the city. So there's a city where the road diverges and when the king of Babylon comes there, uh, he has a choice to make. Mark out one road for the sword to come against Rabbah and the, uh, of the Ammonites and the other against Judah and the fortified Jerusalem. For the king of Babylon will stop at the fork of the road, the juncture of the two roads, to seek an omen. He will cast lots with arrows. Basically, he will mark arrows, put them in a quiver, shake up the arrows, pull one out, and that's how he'll decide. He will also consult his idols. He will examine the liver, uh, ancient ways that uh, pagan religions sought omens and guidance from their gods. And into his right hand, remember we, how we said earlier, the the maps of in the ancient world were kind of turned on the side and so to the south was right so into his right hand will come the lot for jerusalem so the right side of the road the right way not the correct way the, the one on the right where he is to set up battering rams to give the command to slaughter to sound the battle cry to set battering rams against the gates to build a ramp and to erect siege works it will seem like a false omen to those who have sworn allegiance to him. And so the people who are in Jerusalem here, they're going to go, no, 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 no. We swore an omen to you, or I swore a, a allegiance to you, even though they had broken that. And so they're going to assume that all of these ways were, were incorrect and wrong, which they're obviously not the ways that God wants us to seek guidance. But God's in control of this whole thing. It will seem like a false omen to those who have sworn allegiance to him, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but he will remind them of their guilt because they have transgressed the covenant that they made with him, and he will take them captive. So all this is talking about 
King Nebuchadnezzar is traveling from Babylon along the uh, uh, Fertile Crescent up along the rivers. And so he makes an arch over to where he's coming into the land of Israel. And once he's coming down into Israel, he will come to a city where there is a choice to be made, which way will I go? So let me give you a quick uh, or a diagram of this. If Babylon is way over here in that area, and he's coming this way into Israel, and this is Israel, he will follow this road. He gets the choice. This is the fork in the road. He's either going to go this way, or he's going to go this way. This way leads down to Raba of the Ammonites, and this is the, called the King's Highway. And this way, the Great Trunk Road, which also becomes the Via Maris, will come down here and then lead down to Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar will stop at this city, Damascus, and ask the question, seek omens, which one do I go destroy, Rabba or Jerusalem? And the lot comes up to go to the right, and that obviously leads down to Jerusalem. And uh, so this crossroads, this city becomes the place of, okay, what's going to happen? Is there destruction or is there life? What's going to happen? There's this big question. I, I have to ponder at this point if Damascus becomes this imagery that's used in scripture for that question. What's going to happen? As God's people are being uh, under under the the potential of being killed, life or death, the decision is made in Damascus. Now, take that idea, lay that pattern over the Book of Acts, because in the Book of Acts we have the Apostle Paul, who is going to Damascus. He is going to Damascus in order to kill God's people. He's persecuting the Christians. He's on his way to kill God's people. And at this city of decision is where he encounters Jesus and becomes blind and then converts uh, his path from death to life. And he then begins say, saying, okay, I'm going to seek to bring people to Jesus as opposed to kill those who are following him. So again, just an interesting use of uh, Damascus as God has in his sovereign sovereignty um, the things that happen there again interesting okay so this is the, the fork in the road that we're talking about or that Ezekiel's talking about in the next verse 24 therefore this is what the sovereign Lord says because you people have brought to mind your guilt by your open rebellion revealing your sins and all that you do because you have done this you will be taken captive so because uh, Jerusalem has pushed back against the, the punishment, the discipline that God has given, then he's saying, okay, then the discipline will get worse. You profane and wicked prince of Israel. So now the attention is turned specifically to Zedekiah. Zedekiah is currently ruling in Jerusalem. He made a covenant with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, swore allegiance to him then he broke it god took that as personally breaking his allegiance to god because god is the one who's been ordaining the discipline and most likely zedekiah um swore in this covenant he used probably his the name of god to swear allegiance to nebuchadnezzar, nebuchadnezzar and now he's breaking that allegiance therefore he is making look, god look bad in essence So God is very displeased with Zedekiah. He says, this profane, you wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come. Basically, your day of destruction, whose time of punishment has reached its climax. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Take off the turban, remove the crown. It will not be as it was. The lowly will be exalted and the exalted will be brought low. Okay. That interesting phraseology there. We'll come to that in a second. A ruin, a ruin. I will make it a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. Again, uh, interesting things in here. First of all, 
Uh, some people refer to this as the day of Zedekiah. So the day of Zedekiah is a reference to the day of his judgment, judgment against him, but most likely the day of his death. We see this, this idiom used multiple times throughout scripture and that they're talking about the day of so-and-so means the day that they die. The day of a person is the day that they die which becomes really interesting when you consider the fact that the day of judgment by God is called the day of the Lord. Now, I've never done a study in this, but just studying this passage, I kind of came across this idea and I like to study it more in depth. And I just wonder if that idiom has that, that dual meaning when you talk about the day of the Lord. His judgment day is also prophetically the day that he dies in other words jesus dies on the cross that judgment falls upon jesus he dies obviously he resurrects he defeats the the, uh, the he defeats death he defeats sin uh, he reinstitutes the covenant but that day of the lord um, i think that there is definitely an aspect that says that the judgment will come upon the lord he will take that judgment Again, lots of meaning woven into that, and that's just maybe potentially one. He also states down here, the lowly will be exalted, and the exalted will be brought low. Uh, that probably rings a bell, and that it comes, or at least the idea is repeated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 20, that the idea is, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Okay, there, there's this whole class structure that gets destroyed in the presence of God. Okay, the, the whole idea of, of what we exalt will be brought low. And the things that are lowly in our eyes will be lifted up. And I feel like we struggle with that in today's church. We have a hard time recognizing uh, the, the value system that God uses. He states at other places as well, Isaiah chapter 24, so the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. This is when the northern kingdom was being taken into captivity by Assyria. And Isaiah says, he will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for the priest as for the people. Destroying a class system. It will be the same for the master as for the servant. Destroying the class system. Destroying the hierarchy. For the mistress as for her servant. For the seller as for the buyer. For the borrower as for the lender. For the debtor as for the creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. So there's an idea that when God's judgment comes, that, that uh, there's not going to be... Um, Everyone will be measured with the same stick. Now, of course, that's where we lean upon uh, the grace and the mercy of the cross. But, but that doesn't elevate us to a point where we have a status in, our, in and of ourselves. We are not worthy to state that, oh, we're, we're better than anyone. So certainly in our lives today, we need to make sure that we're not running around acting that way. We're not better than anyone, okay? When, when God steps in, the, laying, the playing field is leveled. So we need to live our lives that way. He also makes a statement here, the crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. Now, I think that this is a reference uh, going all the way back to Genesis 49.10 because when Judah is blessed, the son Judah is blessed by uh Isaac, or I'm sorry, by Jacob, by Israel, it, the statement is made for Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come. In fact, your version might say, until Shiloh comes. And Shiloh just means that, he to whom it rightfully belongs, which is exactly the wording that is used here. Okay, the crown or the scepter, the ruling, will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. Uh, Jerusalem is sitting, and they're going, no, 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 we're God's people. We've got promises that we can look at. We are living in the land that God put us in, so we can rely upon all that. 
when the crux of all of that relies upon the relationship that they have with God, not land, uh, not their perceived idea of what the promises state, because the promises are hinged upon their relationship with God. So they they skip over their relationship with God, think that they can uh, perform idol worship, they can profane God's name, um, they can uh, practice violence, they can practice inhospitality to uh, strangers and to foreigners. They, they think they can do all these things and still rely upon the promises of God, not realizing that those promises hinge upon uh, their right relationship with him. So it's one of the things that God is pointing out here. Okay, one more slide here, and then we'll close up for today. It says in verse 28, and you, son of a man prophesy and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says about the Ammonites and their insults. And so remember, we took the road to the left. Uh, the, the Ammonites are on the road to the, I'm sorry, we took the road to the right. And Nebuchadnezzar took the road to the right. And the Ammonites are on the road to the left. So they get arrogant. They start saying, ah, a sword, a sword drawn for the slaughter, polished to consume and flash like lightning. Despite false visions concerning you and lying divinations about you, it will be laid on the necks of the wicked who are to be slain, whose day has come, whose time of punishment has reached its climax. And so the, the Ammonites are just getting a little cocky, stating uh, that they're composing songs now against Jerusalem. But then God turns his attention to Babylon as this chapter closes up. And he says, let the sword, so in other words, the punishment that is being meted out by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, return to its sheath and place where you were created. So in other words, he's gonna draw Babylon back home, Nebuchadnezzar back home to Babylon in the land of your ancestry, and I will judge you there. It's really important to recognize that, that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon are not righteous people. Okay. God used them, yes. God used them for his own purposes, but never, ever in the process of this did God say that they were righteous or that anything that they, they were doing was good. God used them and their evil in order to accomplish his purposes. I will pour out my wrath on you. So now his wrath turns towards Nebuchadnezzar and breathe out my fiery anger against you. I will deliver you into the hands of brutal men and men skilled in destruction. We'll see that later in history. You will be fuel for the fire. Your blood will be shed in your land. You will be remembered no more for I, the Lord, have spoken. So again, uh, while God does use Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Babylon as his weapon, as his sword of discipline against his people, he does not condone Babylon in that process. He says, you will also be judged. Um, so let's not look at God's choice of, of um, method as approval of those people. All right, so we'll stop there. That's the end of chapter 21. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. I pray that it is uh, fruitful, that it opens our eyes, that we might meditate on it, and uh, that we might return looking for more instruction from you. And help us to take these things and see how they overlay our lives. Find the patterns that are in them and apply them to ourselves, not, not to others. Lord, our faith in you, is meant to change us and so that we might help others. It's not the other way around. It's not meant for us to use to change others and so they can help us. Help us to keep that in mind, Lord. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Uh, open up your Bibles. Read about this God who loves us so much. We'll be uh, tackling chapter 22 next week. So I uh, hope you'll come back and join us. And uh, have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy.